Hello, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us for our speaker series event tonight with uh, Sam Cordum, who is going to be speaking to us on gains from trade and inequality, which I see is what his slides say. So that's good. Uh, Sam is visiting uh, with us this quarter from Yale. It's kind of funny that people like to come from places like Yale, winter quarter in particular, I find, but uh, we're always delighted to have them. Um, you may have come tonight with things like TPP or NAFTA on your mind, uh, and I'm certain that you'll be hearing some about them. Um, if you did, uh, I would also just take the chance to shamelessly let you know that on April 5th, we'll be having an event um, with Carlos Pascual, who is former American ambassador to Mexico, uh, and also with uh, Arturo Sarucan, who is former Mexi Mex Mexican ambassador to the United States. I think it will be a very uh, timely moment also to speak about NAFTA, so I hope you'll join us then as well. Um, so I'm going to say some embarrassing things about Sam that you can find out uh, by going to his website. And we've also started a tradition of telling you something that you're not going to learn by going to any of our speakers' website as well. So I'll leave you in suspense for a moment, and I'll reveal this about Sam as well. So Sam is the James Burroughs Moffitt Professor of Economics at Yale. He received his undergraduate degree from Wesleyan University, his PhD, uh, also from Yale. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Before Sam moved to Yale, uh, he was on the faculty at Boston University, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Chicago. Uh, he also served as an economist on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. In 2004, he and a colleague, Jonathan Eaton, received the Frisch Medal, uh, which is considered uh, one of the top three prizes in the field of economics. This was for a paper entitled Technology, Geography, and Trade, which was published in Econometrica. He's also served as an editor of the Journal of Political Economy. Beyond his work on international trade, Sam has also done research on trade and carbon taxes on the semiconductor industry, on patenting and productivity, and innovation more generally. So that's the, that's the very important uh, stuff that you can find out about Sam by visiting his website. Um, so as I said, we do have this tradition of revealing something that you won't learn by going to a speaker's website. If you joined us to see Sendo Molinathan, you learned that he has a passion for restoring antiquated espresso machines. Uh, in Sam's case, uh, Sam has been interested in economics since he was a child. And according to his mother, uh, he became interested in economics, uh, in particular through raising hogs. Uh, and I, Sam, I'll just let you fill us in on the rest as you like or as you, as you don't like. Um, I'm also delighted to introduce Pete Klenau, uh, who is sitting here next to Sam and will be moderating our event tonight. So Pete is the Landau Professor of Economics here at Stanford. He's also the Gordon and Betty Moore Senior Fellow uh, here at CEPR, and he's a member of our Center's Faculty Steering Committee as well. He, his, he received his PhD from Stanford. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, he's also a consultant uh, to the Federal Reserve Banks of San Francisco and Minneapolis, and he also works with the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. He's associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of, Econometrics, of Economics and of Econometrica, and he previously served on the board of editors of the American Economic Review. Um, Pete specializes in macroeconomics with emphasis on prices, productivity, economic growth. Pete, I have no additional interesting facts to add about you, so... I'll let you fill those in as well as you like. Please join me in welcoming uh, Sam Cordum. Well, thanks for the introduction. I'll, uh, one little addition to that story, even as a young kid, I wasn't that fast on my feet. Uh, at making calculations. And I remember I always wanted to sell my, the piglets for kind of a little bit above market price, which was $35. And one guy came and uh, said, oh, I'll take three for 100. And I just, you know, I was kind of like, ah. But I just said, no. <laughs> and then I remember I sold two for 35, so that was pretty good. But then the third one, I ended up having to spend almost a day selling it in an auction, and I think I only got about $20 for it. So I three times 
35 is 105 dollars. So I nixed the deal based on five dollars, which I only realized afterwards because I was kind of too uh, thrown, flustered by his offer to figure that out. So thus I went into academics rather than the trading floor. Of, uh... <laughs> okay, so thanks for inviting me here. Um, let's get started. So I wanted to, you know, I, I feel a little bit working in the area of trade, you're sort of bombarded recently by, by all this stuff that's going on. So you kind of feel like, well, what's going on? We felt like there was this real consensus that opening up to trade was always, you know, was typically a good thing, and, and maybe one could get kind of carried away with that. But anyway, recently we've had the U.S. withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We've had, um, uh, we've had talk about renegotiating NAFTA. And you could react and say, oh, that's kind of coming from the same area as climate denial. But that's not, it's not quite so easy. I mean, sort of unfortunately, you can't kind of knock it down so easily because, in fact, there's some very uh, solid recent research that is finding some effects of, of trade driving inequality, so sort of a negative. So I want to kind of bring that into my talk and, um, and balance it with the more traditional view of the gains from trade. So I want to sort of have this tension between a more traditional uh, trade is good, gains from trade, why do we think that, with, okay, how do we weave in this, what is kind of the most straightforward to a broad audience, simple way to explain the, the, the increase in inequality that could go along with it. Um, so, but let me start with kind of the big picture here, which is that um, trade's a positive sum game. I mean, I do think that's where the current administration might not really even understand the idea of a, of a kind of positive sum game, but it is. And it means that in principle, both sides could be gaining. It's not just a pure negotiation where everything I, you, you get only when the other side gives. Um, but it is disruptive, and in that way, and that's what I kind of want to bring out in a, in a simple way, and that could be driving some inequality. Um, but another point is at some level, it's not that big a deal. When you look, I mean, it's not, there's not, uh, you know, most of the things aren't traded still, especially in a big country like the U.S. On the other hand, in a big country like the U.S., there's a huge amount of trade going on within the country, which is very similar in nature. And we have this sort of customs union that applies to the United States. And luckily, that one doesn't seem to be up for renegotiation. Okay. Um, and then... Finally, we do have, I mean, going along with the fact that trade isn't that huge, is the idea that there are other more powerful forces. If you were going to tell the story of U.S. economic growth, you could well just leave trade out of that and you'd get it mostly right. So I think that's important to keep in mind as well. Because you can get kind of excited when you're teaching trade, you start, becoming, start thinking it's everything and then you've got to step back and, and realize that that's not true. Okay, so in this talk, I want to start with a little bit of data. I'm going to be pretty, it's, it's, it's just a tiny bit. I want to spend a good chunk of time kind of developing the economic logic of trade. So I feel a little embarrassed that there are a fair amount of number of economists in the audience who might find this a, like I'm sort of talking down to them, but the only thing I can say is that I think there's a little bit of novelty in the way I'm going to show this very simple economic logic of trade, but it is very simple. Okay. Um, then I want to lead to recent quantitative work and, and what that's uncovered, and I will try to have developed the logic in such a way that it kind of motivates the recent economic work. And I want to give some acknowledgement to a paper that I've sort of cribbed from a bit, which is uh, from Paul Krugman. It's the fourth chapter of his top internationalism book. Which 
is interesting. He wrote that right after the NAFTA negotiation, or right after, probably right after NAFTA was passed, early in the Clinton administration. And yet, when you read it, all the same issues are there. So it's like we haven't made any progress at all in some sense. And, you know, maybe some of the things that were now talked about with China were then talked about with Japan. So if you just replace the word uh, Japan with China, it's sort of exactly what is in the air today. Okay, so my basic facts. This picture is simply trade in goods and services, which is the average of imports and exports, divided by GDP, all just everything measured in dollars. And there are two things to point out here. One is that the axis is correct, and it really was only about 5% for a long time, very low. And then the second point is that it's tripled. So that been has been an important uh, feature of the US since the 1960s, is this rise in trade as, as a fraction of the overall economy. Now, this picture, the actual numerical values, I'm going to come back to later in the talk. So you just kind of remember that at the, now it's around 14%. In the 60s, it was around 5%. Those are the two numbers that we'll use later. Here's another thing to see here. These are just the same numbers in, in the 70s, 85, 2000, 2015 for the US. The point is they're low relative to all these other countries. Now that, you might think, oh wow, the US is a very closed economy in some sense. Well, but on the other hand, it's a big economy, so it's very natural that we'd mostly just buy from our own producers because we're already a pretty big chunk, like a quarter of world GDP. So um, that's not, it, that is sort of a standard thing that our models understand, but it's still interesting to note that most countries have a larger share of trade to GDP than does the US. Okay, now I'm gonna do this in kind of, a, I guess, a economic history of, history of thought way to some extent in that I wanna go back to a, a kind of Ricardo and, and what J.S. Mill added to his ideas and then uh, uh, Arthur, Sir Arthur Lewis and, and then up to this Krugman article I mentioned. But, Last time I gave this talk, it was the 200th anniversary of Ricardo's theory. Now it's the 201st. Um, but what I want to get across, this is kind of a, using these theories, kind of basing things on these theories, really gets you to very raw economics in the sense that there's really nothing to hide. There's no math to be, hide behind. You just got to think through it. So it's kind of neat that way. It's a little scary for me because you know, you can really bungle it and you can't just say, oh, well, you just take this derivative and here I really need to explain each piece. There's not, it's all kind of on the surface. But, it, it, but in some ways it's kind of sophisticated in that it has this general equilibrium aspect, which was really what was so amazing about Ricardo was he, he actually thought deeper. It wasn't just kind of simple observation. It was actually trying to think through an economic system. Um, and a lot of the work I've done with my co-author Jonathan Eaton has really been trying to develop a, a model we can use that's not so stylized, built on those foundations. And so then I feel less funny talking about this very stylized model if kind of the logic of it can be carried over into the logic of something that we might use for real policy work. Okay, so here are the... Here's the foundations of the Ricardian model. It's a bunch of productivity. So a bunch of, a set of numbers that tell you how much workers in different countries can produce of different types of goods. So the two countries in my example are the US and China. There are these three goods, a kind of a low tech good, a medium tech good, and a high tech good. And notice that except for low tech where they're tied, the US is more productive. But the key thing that Ricardo realized is what really matters for trade is the fact that the ratio of the US to China is higher in high tech than in low tech where the ratio is one, but the US is 25 times more productive in the high tech and that's what matters for trade. Um, now, we're gonna, and then 
It doesn't come in much, but if you really wanted to work through my example, you'd need to know these numbers of how many workers there are in each country. Um, the preferences, so it is interesting, Ricardo never talked about why people buy stuff. He just left that out, so it was kind of incomplete, but that's what John Stuart Mill did, is say, okay, one way to think about preferences is that people want to spend the same amount on each good. I mean, that's obviously just a special thing, but it, it, there is, that's a well-established set of preferences that could, could be what's going on, and it makes my example very simple. And then we're going to, at points, we're going to kind of measure things all relative to the price of the medium tech good being one. Okay. So the first thing, ah, then we're going to go through three scenarios. And the last time I gave this talk, I don't think I had set that up very well. So this should help you kind of see where I'm going to go. We're going to first think about a scenario where there's no trade. Now, that seems kind of silly. And yet, well, in the 60s, the U.S. has only had 5%, so it's a good approximation of reality not long ago for a big country like the U.S. But that gives us kind of a base with which to compare a world where we do start trading. And so that's going to be the role of what we call autarky, is to then open these countries up to trade and see the logic of why there would be gains from trade. And then, to capture the inequality part, I go to step scenario three, which is where workers are kind of stuck in where the same jobs they had as under autarky, we move to free trade, then what's going to happen? And it turns out to be radically different than what happens in the Ricardian model, and we get all sorts of inequality coming up. So my... The idea here is to just do everything with this, the same little setup to see both the gains from trade point and the inequality point all within the same system and where the mobility of labor to move across sectors is kind of key. And then that's going to turn into the ability to labor to move across space to different areas of the country. And that's going to be the... I, that's going to lead to the empirical work. Um, Pete, can you keep me on time? Um, okay, so in the first scenario, try, I'm going to keep these numbers up here because those apply, but we can think about the first thing here without those numbers. Try to put those numbers out of your mind. And remember that spending is the same on each of these high tech, low tech, medium tech. The same amount is spent, like, you know, a trillion dollars on each one. Okay, that's all you need to know. Now the workers are just trying to figure out where should I work? Where do I get the higher wage? Well, it's got to be that they spread themselves equally because there's this, this, the trillion dollars is going to be spread across a number of workers, and it's only when the same number of workers are in each sector that they'll be get paid the same. But if they're not paid the same, then the guy who's paid less moves over to the place where you get paid more. So it has to be that if workers can move around in this autarky world, that the wage will be the same in each sector and that the same number of workers will be in each sector given the preferences, which says that the spending is the same on each sector. So that's our baseline. Same wages, same number of workers in each sector. Now, think about that. Now we can talk about why the US grew. Well, it's all about those numbers getting bigger for the first row. That's productivity gains. That's why when we talk about technology, it's basically just saying the numbers for the US, the numbers in the first row got bigger. Now think about what that says. The workers are going to remain equal numbers in each sector. We're going to get the productivity gains. We're going to get uh, increases in the standard of living because we have the same workers producing more. We're multiplying bigger numbers times the same number of workers because they don't reallocate and we just get productivity gains. So that gives us a very simple way to think about why you know, the US grew so much since uh, colonial times. OK, now, um, and we can see how that would clearly raise the standard of living, because those workers with the higher productivity just produce more stuff. So everybody's getting paid more in terms of the goods that they can purchase. Now, we can. 
we've made that whole argument. Now let's think about those numbers themselves and how those determine prices. And we can just point to, take these two numbers here, 5 and 10. Well, there's one guy, they're getting the same wage. There's one guy who's only producing five things, and the other guy's producing 10. So the guy producing the five things, those things better sell for twice as much as the guy producing the 10 things, because otherwise you couldn't afford to pay the same wage to both of those people. So that's Ricardo's labor theory of value, that productivity determines prices inversely. So if you're not very productive, like teaching, there has to be a high tuition to make it uh, uh, equal to other sectors that you could work in. OK. So now that, notice that gives, I mean, we can then just go from those numbers to the prices. Remember I said that the low tech had to sell for twice as much as medium tech in the US? Well, that's why there's a, a two there. The low tech sells for two, the medium tech one, and the high tech's really cheap because that's sort of like computer chips are so, we're so productive at them that they're cheap now. OK, so that's autarky. But let's, we did the same thing with China. Now we can see why there wants to be trade. Because you put these two countries together. Remember, they're in autarky to begin with. They're not trading. The prices are different. But now you can see, wow, they're looking at the low tech. Well, it's so much cheaper in China. And then they're looking at the high tech. Oh, it's so much cheaper in the US. Why don't we trade? So you can see that's the gains from trade, is that you take advantage of those price differences by trading. So what you're going to do is the US is going to buy all the low tech from China, and China is going to buy all the high tech from the US. You're going to kill the low tech um, industry in the US, and you'll kill the high tech industry in China. That's kind of the brutalism of trade in this very simple setup. And yet, um, it's going to be good for us. Why? OK. Um, so we get these prices. How did I get those? Those were just the lower. You just go down each column and pick the lower one. That's going to be the resulting price. And here's a way to think about the gains from trade. It's as if there was no trade, and the US productivity in low tech jumped up from 5 to 25. So that, and since we know productivity gains raise the standard of living, hence, Trade would raise the standard of living. And in fact, in this world, that would be a 70% gain. But there is a key difference. Because in the thing with productivity gains, nobody has to change their job. In the, in the same gain generated by trade, you had to abandon the low-tech sector in the US, and you had to abandon the high-tech sector in China. So in fact, it's very different. You get the same. if People can move costlessly. You get the same gain with productivity or trade. Um, but one is very disruptive of employment, requires people to move across sectors, and the other doesn't. OK, so the question is, what if, the, what if in fact, the workers just don't move? They just stay where they were in autarky, and yet you open up the countries to trade. So it was very embarrassing to say that I was working on this a year ago, I think, for a, for a class I was teaching at, at Chicago Booth, just a kind of guest lecture. And I, I was actually kind of stumped. I was like, what does happen? Now I'm getting really confused, because I thought this would be a neat thing to think about. And then I was kind of like, I don't know, what happens? And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, that's just what we call the endowments theory of trade, what is that? That says that you just have these people stuck in their sectors. They have their productivities. And it's going to mean that uh, China produces a kind of relatively large amount of the low-tech stuff, and the US produces a relatively high amount of the high-tech stuff. So they'll still want to trade, but now the trade is only taking advantage of the fact we all kind of want the same stuff, but we're producing different amounts of it, even if workers don't move. And so that's a very, uh, that's another uh, theory of trade, that we only trade to sort of production doesn't get affected by trade. It's just we sort of swap goods to kind of get the same market basket as the other guy has. 
OK. So in that world, and I'm not going to lead you through it, it turns out those are the resulting prices. Now, they don't give you as big a gains. So now we only get a 22% rise in the standard of living of the US rather than the 70%. And we only get that if everything's perfectly redistributed. In the basic Ricardian model, everybody gets the same wage. So we all share perfectly in the 70%. Here, there's a much smaller gain. And it's going to be very unequally distributed unless a government policy did the redistributing. And why is that? Because uh, let's look at the wages that result from this world. Well, you got these guys who are just steadfastly working in low tech, even though we opened up to China. They're having to compete with the Chinese. They have to have a super low wage to be able to compete. Now, obviously, this is extreme. but. Uh, their wage goes way down relative to medium tech. And then the high tech guys are, are really in great shape. So that's kind of Silicon Valley. They're just sitting there. They're the only ones who know how to do it. And suddenly, China's buying all this stuff from them. So they're really, their wages are being bid up. And so there's this huge amount of inequality. Remember, before, the wage was 10 in every sector, either in uh, I mean, the wage would have been the same in autarky across sectors. The wage would be the same in the Ricardian model of trade across sectors. And now it's suddenly much lower in low tech and much higher in high tech than it would have been in those other scenarios. And that's kind of this inequality that we're talking about. Now, the other thing to say is that in practice, this redistribution doesn't really happen. Now, in practice, people don't just all stay in low tech. But the point is, there's not as much mobility as we would like to see to get those gains spread out better. Um, and I think this is a kind of very simple way to talk about the kind of populist backlash against uh, trade, is that some people are in that low tech, stuck in that low tech sector. Now, I'm going to turn that into not being stuck in a sector but being stuck in a part of the country where that sector is dominant, and then you kind of get the same thing. But now it's going to show up as where you happen to live. And then the immobility is not wanting to leave where you grew up. And then that's going to generate the same sort of a situation as we're, as we're getting here. Um, now, notice that I've stayed away. If you read the. This is where I, de I did say I borrowed some from Krugman, but I've done this differently. He had kind of gotten into what's called the hector olin model to explain inequality. And then inequality is about high skill versus low skill. Now, that, those differences are very real. But my feeling from the recent literature is it was only when people started looking at the geographic dimension of inequality that they found such a big role for trade. So I'm sort of trying to steer away from the old way of explaining the inequality through skill and unskilled via trade. Uh, I think there's been a lot of increase in skill versus unskilled generated by technology. But if you're trying to think of the first order thing with trade, I sort of like this story better, where it's really not about skills. It's about place. Um, OK, so that leads me to the empirical part. OK. So when we want to attach numbers, I was working with a toy model, as you may have noticed. Uh, so the 70% was not a real number that corresponds to the actual economy. But I did argue that the kind of model I'm talking about has serious analogs that we can use to get real numbers. OK. So what can we say quantitatively about these things? I, I kind of want to point out here something that, I mean, there's kind of a methodological uh, schism, is that the word, kind of <laughs> in, in the profession about different ways to think about how we'll use the data. And there's kind of a structural approach, approach which in its most extreme uses the data to nail down certain parameters in the kind of model I was talking about that's more complicated, but it has that same sort of a structure. 
and you get the values of those parameters that match data in some particular way, and you kind of stick them back into the model, and then you can use the model for any darn thing you want, because the model, if it's right, it kind of tells you everything. And then there's the reduced form approach, which is very much like being a purist saying there's data, let's not contaminate it with the model, I'm going to the extreme, and let's just try and read what the data has to tell us about the issue that we're interested in. Okay, so I'm kind of making an extreme here just to make it interesting. Okay, so let's talk about what's the, who would ever not like, I mean, most people who aren't economists like the second way better because it's sort of easier to understand and nobody believes our models. So uh, but here I'm going to be honest and say, well, there are, even though I'm sort of an adherent more to the structural approach, what would be issues with it that I would think are valid? So I'm not going to take as valid that, oh, it has math in it, so it's bad. We want to have a deeper thing. And I think one argument is using a, the structural approach, you're kind of buying into a particular model. And that particular model might have missed certain things that are important, and you can get kind of blinded. Because to do it right, you sort of have to believe the model, but then the but believing the model can blind you to certain issues that the model doesn't capture. Perfectly valid criticism. And then the other one is it's not always that easy to use the data to figure out what the parameters of the model are. So the, that can often be challenging. But as I said, if you have a good model, it kind of has all the answers. So um, that, that's kind of the you know, what the hope that it gives you is that it kind of allows you to, to do any old kind of, answer any old kind of question because you have the full theory of what's going on in the world. Okay, now, what would be the challenges of the reduced form approach? Well, it's challenging to separate the role of international trade versus other things that are going on. So it's all about that, trying to isolate the role of international trade as uh, the driving force for something that happened. Now, people have been very clever about ways to deal with that and to isolate the role of technological change through careful data analysis. But then, those strategies, which are very clever, tend to limit the kind of questions you can answer. And in particular, in the trade context, kind of rules out making statements about what happened overall. And it leaves out all the kind of general equilibrium stuff that was described in the models that I showed you. So that's not totally satisfying, but it's kind of well suited to capture differences. So it's set up to kind of capture this, this went this way relative to this way. We don't know if it went this or this, but we know that this one went up relative to this. And so it's good for the inequality question, because that's all you really need to know. That, you know, wages of people in this area went up relative to people in this area. Well, you don't know whether it went up relative. They both, might have both gone down. They might have both gone up. But there's no question that there's some inequality was generated. This methodology is perfectly fine for that. Okay, so now I'm going back to the structural approach, and then I'll go to some findings of the um, reduced form approach. Okay, so in the work I've done with Jonathan, one of the things that we came upon, and, uh, and later it was shown to be much more general, but what we, in a, the narrow context, see, we had our blinders on. Within our model, we got an expression that related lambda, which was your share of spending domestically, how much of your budget gets spent on local producers uh, within the country. That's lambda. And from that figure, we saw that went from 0.95, remember, 5% in the 60s, up to 14%, went up to 0.86, down to 0.86, because this is 1 minus that trade share. Uh, very crude. OK, then there's a parameter in the model we have that captures Ricardian comparative advantage. Remember how the US had a comparative advantage in high tech, and China had a comparative advantage in low tech. Well, it turns out that one can kind of capture in a simple way with a parameter 
um, something that controls how different those relative productivities are. And that's theta, and that a, has a value of around four. So then we can calculate the gains from trade from plugging these numbers into there. And it says the US would lose about 4% if it just stopped trading, meaning if lambda became one, so we'd kind of have a 4% drop in GDP. Now, important to say, that's not like a bonus one year. That's like you lose that every single year, 4%. So it's like a, it's like a wage cut, not a, them taking away $1,000 from you in one year. Or if we went back to the 60s, we'd lose 3%. Now, in some level, those are very small numbers, I think. So then you have to, to realize, yes, but this is a big country, and there's a lot we do. I mean, if you think about your everyday life, most of the time you're doing stuff. You go to the Koopa Coffee place. You uh, go to a class. You, um, you go to a restaurant. Those are not traded things. So the, the role of trade is in a, a kind of narrow part of our budget, and that's why numbers like this aren't that overwhelmingly huge. So that's kind of the... You could say that is kind of the um, upper bound on the damage we could do if we just kind of uh, uh, scrap all our trade to just kind of erect a barrier around the country. OK. So now what about NAFTA? Well, I'm going to show you. Uh, this is from a paper by uh, Caliendo and Perro where they do a, a much more sophisticated model of the same style we're still talking about scenario two. We're talking about a kind of traditional Ricardian analysis where people can move across sectors freely. How much did the three countries gain by um, uh, uh, signing on to NAFTA? Well, this takes account of their lost tariff revenues. And that's why Canada actually, according to this analysis, lost. Mexico gains over 1%, and the US gains just a small amount. So once again, we're seeing kind of these small numbers. Now, why are these numbers smaller than the ones before? Because I was doing more extreme things, saying, what if the US stopped trading? Well, NAFTA came in. We already had low tariffs. We were already trading a lot with Mexico. So it just lowered the tariffs a little bit more. You know, That led to small gains. Um, the interesting thing is that, in fact, at the same time, trade volumes went up a lot. And this model can capture the fact that we started trading a lot more with Mexico. Now, there's kind of a, a subtlety there. The question is, if you started trading so much more with Mexico, um, uh, you have to wonder, well, why weren't you, you know, somehow this small change in tariffs made you trade a lot more, well, that has to mean that the comparative advantage wasn't that strong, that you, uh, you just jumped towards trading much more. And so actually, the fact that you started trading much more is not indicative of huge gains necessarily. In fact, it can work the opposite way. OK. And then railroads in India, I'm going to skip quickly over this, but Dave Donaldson, who won the Clark Medal, that's the second of the three things, um, you get uh, found that building the railroads, using a very similar analysis, but very cleverly redefining, instead of labor, it's land, and uh, it's within the country rather than between countries. He, he calculated that the gains from, build, from the British building the railroad in India were uh, 17%. So, as, so that's a bigger number. But again, that's that trade within a country that's very important. Um, OK, so what about a reduced form analysis and increasing inequality from trade? I, I kind of talked about this already, so let me be quick. But the point, how am I doing for time? Please. I'm, OK, yeah, OK. Uh, uh, but we're talking about a scenario three where the workers are stuck but we're going to reinterpret it as stuck geographically and that the industries aren't spread out evenly. So if you're in an area where the only industry is low tech and you can't move geographically, well, then you're basically stuck in low tech, even though maybe you would be happy to go to high tech if they had any high tech in, in Kentucky. OK, so 
uh, your, your workers, um, and so we saw how workers would suffer a wage decline if they're stuck in low tech in here because of geography. And I, that's my interpretation of what the reduced form approach is finding. Okay, now I'm gonna start with a paper that was about Brazil by uh, uh, Kovac, Brian Kovac and Rafael Dix Carnero because it's very nicely connects it to a policy. So it looks at Brazil's cut in tariffs and then finds that in certain states of Brazil are very specialized in the industries where the tariff got cut. And it does find that people in those states got hurt. And trying to go a little fast, you know, it's big. It says that between those states where their industries didn't get uh, have very big tariff reductions in those states where they were in the 90th percentile of tariff reductions, you have a 15% wage differential. So it's, it's not a small effect that he found. Furthermore, it's kind of long lasting. So I think this really kind of erects a challenge to international trade, both the size of these effects and the fact that they're very long lasting. It seems like certain states were hurt for a long time. The very famous work that's been done is on what's called the China shock, all the increased imports from China, and where it was Otter Dorn and Hansen and kind of realized that where you'd see the action of that is by looking across uh, areas of the US that were differentially exposed to that. And they find big uh, effects. I can't say negative again, but these differential effects. Because once again, this. Analysis doesn't tell you whether everything went up or everything went down, but it says some gained relative to others. And that's what it's good for isolating. But here I wanted to just mention that the, kind of in its infancy, there's sort of a response. I mean, the people who are doing the empirical work are not uh, being ignored, and the people who are building the models are trying to think about what's missing in the models, and in this case, different forms of trade frictions. And I think this uh, paper that I mentioned here is a very nice version of that where it picks up uh, geographically in the US the fact that manufacturing wages would have uh, gone, uh, gone down from this China shock. And since it's a structural model, you can tell the direction it also has the differential stuff that Otter, Dorn, and Hansen were talking about. So I'm hopeful that this kind of work is gonna bridge the gap between these two approaches. So what are my conclusions? I think theory and evidence suggest their gains from trade, but I think there needs to be uh, acknowledgement of the distributional consequences, which means that some people are getting very likely hurt by trade and for sure it's opening up some inequality. Uh, and I think it calls for thinking about policies either that should be gotten rid of that hamper labor mobility or should be instituted that would increase the ability of uh, people to move across space as suggested by um, the differential opportunities in different parts of the US. We're supposed to sit here. Yeah. <laughs> that was the waters. I gotta go get my water. All right. So Sam and I are both from Northern California. Grew up here. Um, he went all over the country. You heard, and I'm stuck. Um, <laughs> so he's uh, doing so poorly by being <laughs> stuck in the low tech sector. Um, so the four percent number of the gains from trade in the U.S. Um, that's surprisingly small to, you know, even economists, I think. And but you're also famous for work on idea flows, including across countries and the creation of new ideas. So do you think the gains from trade might be substantially larger if one took into account that one country can invent something and that knowledge can flow elsewhere and be shared? Yeah, so a way to think about that is, I think for sure the answer is yes, if we mean that by being in a big world, sharing ideas 
we gain a lot. The thing that's more very un, that I'm very unsure about is whether opening up to trade in physical goods is so important for that to happen. Some of the work that's been done, like uh, thinking particularly of uh, Ezra Oberfield, it's, it's sort of like you just, you know, a little bit of trade, maybe that all that you need to get the ideas flowing around. It's not clear that, you know, we had to have NAFTA to get more ideas from Mexico or from Mexico to get more ideas from us. That may have been going on anyway. That would likely be a huge gain to the world and to each country being able to share the ideas because ideas are non-rival. Um, but the role of trade deals in that is less clear. OK. So, so maybe going back to autarky, that would be a big source, a big loss. But, but if they cut off ideas flows, but maybe all right. right we're but you could kind of have autarky in goods without autarky in ideas, I guess. So let me ask a related question then. If we're, if we're relative to autarky, lots of ideas are flowing. No country is going to take into account all the benefits of generating new ideas because the rest of the world is going to benefit a lot from them. And you're saying we're already, a lot of those ideas are flowing already, so the rest of the world's benefiting a lot from, say, innovation in the United States. We pay a lot of attention to things like global climate accords. Should we have a global trade accord where we promote, or a global innovation accord where we promote creation of ideas throughout the world? Um, yeah, so I think that. Um, well, I think an interesting example is, um, I mean, think about the, the, one of the things the Trump administration has been very upset about is that China often requires the companies that want to get access to the market to kind of give away some of their technology or share it in some sense. And that's a tough question because I think if you're an economic nationalist, it could well be that you don't want to, you, you, you want to fight against that. Even though you could say from a broader perspective, it's always good to share ideas. But it's not necessarily good for the US, even when the company is gaining, it could be bad for the US to share ideas. That can be well articulated in a formal sense. So I do think there's a real issue there. Um, if, you're, if you're just thinking about workers in the US, they could be easily hurt by that. So on the inequality side, um, do you, are there any policies you favor to make the gains from trade spread farther, uh, more evenly? Uh, yeah, right. Um, I think what hasn't worked very well, I'm, I, uh, I'll admit to being not an expert in this, because let me kind of lay the, lower your expectations for my answer, which is that in describing what I went through, I mean, I was a guy who lived in scenario two. And I was trying to give this talk about you know, where scenario three kind of fits in and, and to try and speak to a lot of recent work that's been done. So I'm only kind of adjusting to that situation myself. My sense is that um, you know, sort of worker retraining and, and so on sounds like the right thing to do, but hasn't worked very well. And so that's why I was thinking that maybe policies which make sure we're not limiting people's option to move when they want to. I mean, I think things about the housing market could feed into that. Um, I should mention a, a student of mine at Yale is, is working on such issues. But I think some sort of less obvious and indirect things may be most important here. But I don't feel I have the, the answer yet. OK. So why don't I open up in case there's questions in the audience? So in the back first. Start with a comment and then a question. Um, uh, during the 80s, when the US was particularly down versus, say, Asia at that particular point in time, uh, we had certain industries like automobiles, steel, and others that were suffering uh, uh, from the competition with the, with the, uh, the so-called nominal foreign imports. 
But at the same time, that, those same losses uh, challenged uh, the automobile companies over time and challenged the steel industry over time to overcome their productivity issues, labor issues, and some of the friction they had in their businesses to improve both not only the quality but the cost effectiveness of their businesses. And that productivity in turn uh, drove down the number of people that were required to make the same automobiles, ton of steel, et cetera. And productivity has had as much a role as trade has in, uh, in, uh, in employment dislocation in the United States, if not more so. And that productivity was not a function of somebody coming up with a good idea at the time. It was a function of, a, of an overseas party saying, I can do this better, and I'm going to sell to you. And now you have to be able to do it as well or better than I can to compete in the same marketplace. So there's more of a dynamic there. It's an iterative situation where it's not just trade. Trade challenges us to change what we do. And so with that in mind, uh, what would you, uh, uh, and also one further comment, you know, I think it was, what, 1990 or so, uh, China dumped about 300 semi-skilled workers onto the labor market uh, through op the opening up of trade uh, with China. Uh, relative to the entire uh, workers market, that was a substantial number of people that were entering into the productions of goods and services. So would you say a frictionless trade system uh, would be add to the productivity of the world economy as a whole, or would you say that that managing trade would add more to the productivity as a whole? Um, let's see. There were several things. Uh, <laughs> let me start with the first issues you talked about, and and all I wanted to add was that I think. The issue Pete brought up was a, a part of that, which was, in fact, a, a movement of ideas of Japanese production to the US. And so maybe you could say the trade, it's kind of what you brought up is nice because you're saying in this case, the trade might have meant, OK, we better figure out what are those ideas that they have that we don't have. And that might not have happened otherwise. It's a little hard for us to understand why people don't just do the best they can all the time, but it is true. There seems to be some evidence. Another piece of evidence like that is from Jim Schmitz, who looked at uh, the mines in, in northern uh, Minnesota and found how they became much more productive when they faced competition of stuff coming in from Brazil and coming up the St. Lawrence Seaway. So, so there's something there that we don't totally understand and is certainly I had overlooked in my talk here. Um, I guess when you, I, I don't think I'm answering quite what you had in mind, but in the, in the kind of Ricardian frictionless world, the 300,000 Chinese workers would have probably led to um, a more, a, a bigger um, shift, sectoral shift than we actually, uh, so it would have even been more of a dominance maybe in manufacturing by China and the U.S. would have moved into other, other sectors to a greater extent. And so somehow, um, I mean, I'm just saying that's kind of the logic of that and, and the fact that workers are less mobile than uh, in reality than in that stylized model means that there are sectors that are kind of surviving for longer in the US than they would have otherwise. Now the question is though, are we, if we're kind of trying to protect those sectors, are we just sort of fighting against the inevitable? And, you know, we're kind of feeling better now because we're saving some jobs and then we're going to regret it later because we kept this industry kind of, you know, I feel that way about coal. It seems like a good example where, you know, do we, it's painful, but I mean, it's not, I'm not, I'm not going to buy a ticket to Kentucky and go give a speech in front of a bunch of coal miners about this, but maybe that does need to, we need to acknowledge the fact that we've got to move workers out of some of these, these sectors that are not competitive. And if we don't do that, we're just not being a very dynamic economy and we're not going to grow as fast as we could. There was a question up here. Comment? I love the conceptual way you presented it, and, and I think Ricardo would be delighted to realize that he was a star in the 21st century. Um, but you did startle me at the outset um, by expressing the thought that we, that we, the US, 
seem to be abandoning TP, TPP and, um, and NAFTA. And, you know, tactically, perhaps that's what we've expressed, but I, I think we don't like the terms. We what? I, I think we don't like the terms of TPP and we don't like the terms of NAFTA. And the announcement of the abandonment, I think, is, is a negotiating tactic. I, I don't think that the US is abandoning the idea of it. I think we don't like the idea that that in TP, TPP we're exporting tra in, trade welfare. Yeah, I guess when I, in looking at it to the extent I have, and I, I mean, I, I didn't read everywhere, but I, I, had, I have not read the NAFTA agreement, but I did look a fair amount at the TPP one. It's not so obvious what's so unfair about it. On the other hand, I mean, it looked like something that would benefit a lot of industries in the US, and it was forcing countries that have higher barriers to US exports, they were going to do more than we were going to do for them. But I'm not denying that it could be a negotiating tactic. I mean, you could use in a negotiating tactic where you had a really good deal, but you want to get a really, really, really good deal. So I can't argue against that. And it is interesting that, first of all, TPP seems to be, with a couple extra letters, being kind of resurrected by everybody but the U.S., and now the U.S. is saying, oh, well, maybe, maybe we'll join that. I mean, that is interesting, and it's hard to, I, I'm not, well, as you saw, I'm not a very good negotiator, even on my three piglets, so I, I'm not the one to be talking about negotiating uh, tactics, but uh, it's possible. I mean, because I guess it's a good point that there's been a lot of words and not so much action. And that would kind of feed into kind of a negotiating tactic view of it. Yeah. Uh, the core of this question is, uh, you've, your model has been the uh, international movement of products. You need to couple that with the international movement of capital and labor. Uh, we have a situation where capital is sort of free to move. If we had free movement of labor, that's one way to, to move that redistribute the geographic distribution of labor in the United States. You mean between immigrants, countries you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, immigrants coming in tend to go to the most productive areas. So if we had a much more open and free immigration of labor, along with capital, then that would perhaps achieve a better redistribution of labor productivity in the United States and enhance the standard of living in the United States. Yeah, that's... Um there you run into a real tension between whether you think of yourself as kind of a citizen of the world versus a citizen of the US. And it's true that the, the Ricardian model, which I sort of used as my bedrock here, is sort of, it, it's kind of anti-immigration in the sense that it, it says, if you just bring in a bunch more uh, people, you will, need to lower your prices to, be, to get that great. I mean, the logic is to employ those people, uh, you have to be more competitive so that other people will buy what they produce, and uh, that will lower the wage of the people who are already living there. And that's why it, it doesn't give you such a, when you think of it purely as the welfare of the country that's receiving the immigrants, it doesn't give you a very, it, it, it says, if anything, possibly negatives on that. And now that doesn't, you know, it's not really the only, you know, it may not be designed for that, but because uh, the other way to think about it is somebody comes in and they bring kind of new ideas with them, then all bets are off. But if you just kind of got the same productivity numbers and just put more people in there, it'll hurt the country that takes more people. So I think we probably have time for one more question. David, did you? these sort of uh, policies that may increase labor mobility or, or such like in order to sort of uh, reduce these inequality effects. I, I guess my question is how effective do you think those could be when at least it seems to me looking at recent uh, events that uh, uns or less relatively unskilled blue collar workers uh, have enormous disutility from doing anything other than the manufacturing jobs they've held for 50 years. And yes, they could move to different places and do other jobs, but they'll take some sh huge utility hit from doing that. Their self-esteem 
who they feel like, and there also seem to be millions of Americans who aren't in those jobs who also seem to, their welfare seems to be affected by the destruction of those jobs, even if they themselves are not doing them. I guess maybe in 100 years this would work, but in the short run, do you, do you see any hope for these policies? Well, I mean, I guess you're right, and I guess there's kind of a distribution among people of how painful that is, and you'd want to have a policy that makes it easier for the person who would suffer the least to, who, to leave, and then that in itself would... Now, I, I, I'm not... You know, there, there's doubts in my mind as I say this, but because there could be issues where as you lose those people, maybe those would be the more talented who find it less difficult to leave, and then is the place going to suffer even more? In the theory here, it would actually help, because you'd be getting people out of low tech, and then that would get the wage up. But in reality, maybe that makes the whole community fall apart. So that's a tough one. Somehow. In the US, we were able to move a lot of people out of agriculture over a long period of time. And it probably was painful. And, but I don't think anybody wishes we had 50% you know, of people in agriculture right now. So I do think we have to um, uh, think hard about something that might be painful. Maybe it has to be done very gradually, but otherwise, we're kind of in deep trouble if we can't get people out of sectors where we've got a lot of productivity gains. And in fact, where we, because of trade, where we sort of need to, to get people reallocated to different sectors. All right, quasi-optimistic note that we ended on there. <laughs> um, all right, thanks very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you as well, Pete. Um, so I'll just say we hope you can join us on April 5th with our event with the ambassadors. Because they're not in office anymore, we think they might be more likely to tell the truth. You'll have to come to find out. Thank you. <laughs>